Config 2023. I know that everyone at Figma is really excited to see you all again, especially in person. It's a blessing I don't take for granted. I'm Max McKinney, education designer on the amazing product education team. We've been hard at work creating inspiring educational content for you all. Truthfully though, I'm more excited to see the amazing things that the community will create. Speaking of the community, between in-person attendees and folks joining virtually, we have thousands of community members together right now. Thank you so much for coming. We're really glad that you're here. OK, so I don't know about you, but I'm still taking in all the features uh, that we announced at the keynote today. Um, and our team has been working on them uh, for a while. We finally have tokens in Figma, thanks to variables. Uh, who's pumped for that one? Uh, my background is in product design, specifically working with design systems a lot, and my goodness, I've gotten a few goosebumps seeing what variables can do. That said, though, I know a bunch of you in here will make even more impressive things. And speaking of that, I'm sure you already have a few ideas going. Use hashtag config2023 on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you hang out in the net, and let the world know about your ambitious Figma feature use cases, and I'll keep an eye out for them. If you're here in person and need help finding your way around, Look for a friendly face wearing a blue config tee. We literally have hundreds of Figma employees who have traveled from near and far to create an exceptional experience for you all. And if you're joining us virtually, Figmates are here in the chat, so say hello and reach out if you need anything. OK, I have done enough talking. Let's get started with the first talk of the day, and I'm really excited for this one. Matt is joining us from Alchemist to share practical advice for how small design teams can benefit from design ops. And he's even built a model which you can apply to calculate ROI on design. Matt believes that even small teams both need design systems, but also dedicated design ops to increase efficiency and improve the business overall. How can designers have more influence over product decisions and spend less time tweaking pixels? Well, we're about to find out. Matt will be joining us via video today. He unfortunately is sick, but despite that, he's recorded a video to share his knowledge with us. Please give a big round of applause so Matt can hear you online. Hey, Convig. My name's Matt Goldschalk. I'm VP of design at a company called Alchemist. I hope everyone is having a great time at the conference so far. I'm really sad not to be able to make it there in person, but I'm really glad to be joining virtually today from the UK. I'm just going to share my screen and we can get started. My talk is Bigger Isn't Always Better, how small design teams can benefit from design systems and design operations. Before getting started, I just wanted to give you all a bit of background about me. I've worked in the design industry for over 15 years. Most recently, before joining my current company, I've worked in design operations roles, helping to set up and scale ops and systems teams across two large organizations, Centrica, and BT. In my current role, I head up the design function at Alchemist, where we have a small but growing team of designers. And this is the team. As I said, we're small and we're distributed based across the UK and Canada currently. This photo was actually taken in Montreal last month, where we all got together face to face for the first time to spend some quality time together as a team. Alchemist is historically an engineering-led company, and design is a relatively new function. The team and I are on a journey to increase the impact that design can bring to our company. And two ways we are heavily focusing on currently is design operations and design systems. The focus of my talk is on how ops and systems can help small design teams like ours to deliver more business value to their companies. I'm not going to talk so much about the technical side of ops and systems, more so going to talk about how these two areas can provide the right environments for small design teams like ours to succeed. And this is something that I believe passionately. I believe that design ops and design systems can solve key problem areas in large design teams, and this is really well documented now. 
but we don't so much hear about the value they can bring to small design teams. I will also share some practical advice and tips to help to influence your organisations to invest in these areas, which I know can be really, really challenging. Why do I think this is an important subject to be talking about? Many companies are currently making redundancies or exploring ways to reduce the costs of their tech teams. Many of these companies have scaled their teams rapidly over the last few years. Trying to meet the demands of increased investment in digital transformation programmes. And the COVID epidemic also heightened this rush to ensure that companies could meet their customers' digital needs. Many companies are looking internally at ways to make their organisations more efficient and cost effective. And yes, this article talks about large design teams. But it applies to teams of all sizes. Now more than ever, it's important to be considering the value of every designer in your team. Now more than ever, it's important to be focusing on creating the right environments for designers to deliver business value. This talk is for designers or design leaders that work in small design teams. We want to learn some ways to help their teams work more effectively and efficiently today but also just as importantly, set themselves up for success tomorrow. If you work in a small design team, and by small, I'm talking between one to 10 designers or so, I'm sure you can resonate to these challenges. Being a small team within a large organization or a team that has more engineering led capability can affect the influence that design has. Or designers, for example, that are currently stretched working across a number of different projects this can cause challenges with time constraints and productivity. These definitely resonate with our team and some of the challenges that we face today on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of my team who are watching virtually will no doubt be nodding along their heads at this. Lots of small design teams will have ambitions to scale within their company, to deliver more value, to get budget for more headcount, to be more design-led. And to achieve this, you need to overcome challenges like these, and many more, I'm sure. To do this, we need to be showing value, showing the value that our designers, our teams can bring to the company. Small design teams, what does that value look like? Yes, customer metrics like CX scores, interactions and conversion rates are common metrics that design teams can influence. But in order to achieve these, we first need to be spending more time working with our product peers to shape the product strategy, facilitating internal discussions and aligning across our teams. Why is it sometimes hard for small design teams to focus on these areas? Typically, you may see that designers in small teams that are working across multiple projects or teams will be spending the majority of their time working towards the end of the design process in ideation, prototyping and development delivery stages. Generally, this is to keep pace with the needs of product backlogs and engineering teams, for example. This as a result means there is a reduction in the amount of time they have available to focus in the important stages of discovery, research and better understanding the problems we are trying to solve. I appreciate there are many different design processes and your process will depend on the maturity of your company, but these stages generally reflect the vast majority of ways designers and design teams work. I've interviewed a lot of designers and I know this is a really common issue. The word that keeps coming up is the word time. The project deadlines were so tight, we just didn't have time. I'm the only designer at my company. I know I should be doing more research, but I just don't have time. As an aside, this is also one of the main reasons I hear designers say they are looking to leave their current roles in small design teams. They want to move to a team and a company where they can spend more time doing things like discovery and evaluative research or interviewing stakeholders or facilitating workshops. So actually enabling these environments for your teams may also have a secondary benefit of improving your retention rates and keeping your best designers in your team. In order to enable designers to have more time, 
You first need to understand what is currently taking up their time, which isn't enabling them to deliver value. Where are the opportunities to embed new processes and tools that can improve their efficiency in areas that can be more automated or better managed? Areas like tooling and automation, workflow optimization, collaboration and communication, or research, uh, research sorry, and insights. Focusing on these areas and using time as a key KPI to uncover opportunity areas is a good place to start. And this is design operations work. We frequently read and hear that dedicated design ops roles are required when a team gets to a certain size. Articles like this one, for example, describe the typical journey a company might go on before they decide they need to introduce a dedicated role to help improve the environment for their teams and their designers. I've worked in large design teams and have been responsible for embedding and scaling design ops functions. I've seen firsthand the need to introduce dedicated roles when a team gets to a critical tipping point. And yes, dedicated design ops roles and initiatives can help fix these issues, but they will have a lot of process and cultural ways of working debt to wade through first. If you wait for a team size to hit a critical limit, change management will be much, much harder. So my recommendation is to consider a dedicated design ops role earlier. This is Kat. She is our design ops lead. There she is enjoying an Aperol spritz on our recent team trip to Montreal that I mentioned before. We have decided that there is real value to our small design team and to our business to have her role today focused on creating the best possible environment for our designers. And you may feel that a dedicated person isn't right for you and your teams, but I would encourage you to find someone in your team who is passionate about doing this type of work and start doing it and showing the value it can bring. Who in your team is currently doing this type of work? In your design team, who is responsible for setting up the right environments to enable a more mature design process and practice and integrating designers into their teams effectively? Who is ensuring that there are research toolkits in place so that designers can have quick and easy access to their end users, to learn about their needs and evaluate concepts? And importantly, who is continuously improving the design team culture? Historically, this work may be fragmented across different people in the team, including the manager of the team. I know you don't necessarily need to introduce a dedicated role to do this type of work, but this is the type of work that enables your teams to deliver more value. It enables them to have more time to deliver more value. Having someone dedicated to this means you can continuously improve. It means it doesn't get dropped when designers in small teams are stretched working across multiple projects or project deadlines are tight. The next time you have a, next time you have a role in your team that you need to backfill for, and a design that's just left your company, and you secure some budget to bring in someone else to join your team, take a moment to think if the conditions are right for that person to be successful, and if not, understand why not. I believe in most cases it will be because, it will be because the current environment needs to be improved. Design systems are another important focus area for providing time-saving opportunity areas to your design teams and designers. In such ways as improving how designers and developers work together and bridging that gap between the two disciplines. But the real value comes in providing designers with more time to conduct user research and spending more time in discovery, learning about their users' needs, pain points and opportunity areas and more time spent ideating and testing different solutions and concepts. For a small design team, the additional time to focus on these activities is invaluable. Designers will struggle to help your company become more innovative and solve complex customer problems if they spend most of their time working in design tools to document designs for development handovers or building out different states and interactions for components. Design systems can come in all different shapes and sizes. 
In your company, for example, it could just be a Figma pattern library or a fully coded front end library of foundations, components and patterns. It's all about what works for you and your teams. The point I'm trying to make is you're trying to find ways to actively build, scale, maintain and enhance them within your teams. And for small design teams especially, this can be really challenging to have that dedicated focus on design systems. The work is happening and we all understand the value it can bring, but we're still trying to convince our teams and companies of the benefits of this work and to have it more valued in some cases. Do these quotes resonate with you? Do you currently have someone in your team who is responsible for creating your system? But and most importantly, doing this on the side of their day to day product work. It's the work they are doing, which isn't their core role. And ask yourself how many times this work has needed to be deprioritized when that designer's workload becomes too big. This is a really common challenge. Or are you watching this as someone that has been struggling to convince their company to invest in a dedicated role or team to focus on systems type work? Again, this is another really common theme I've seen. Typically, budgets may be tighter in small design teams, or if the team is a new team, the value of design systems may not yet be known within the business. So it's harder to get this investment and buy-in that we need dedicated time or people working on this. But I think we can change this. We can find ways to get results. In order to better convince and persuade our businesses to invest in design systems, we need to change the narrative. We need to change how we talk about design systems. We need to be shifting from talking about the technical side of design systems to the influence layer. And to do this, we need to learn new skills and importantly, focus our time in other key areas. We've been building up our good technical skills and learning better and more advanced ways to deliver systems into our complex organizations with areas like design tokens or version control or scaling multi-platform systems. But are we investing as much time learning how to influence our business to see systems as a key enabler to business success? By focusing our skills on negotiation, positioning and communication, we can have more success. But where do we start with this? We can, do, we can go away and Google what are the benefits of design systems or ask ChatGBT to create us a nice 2000 word business case. We can pull this into a nice pretty deck that talks about all the benefits of design systems. But will that work? Maybe, perhaps in some cases, I guess it's better than nothing. I've influenced three organizations to invest in dedicated design systems teams over the last seven to eight years. And my experience, a better way to position and communicate the benefits, a way to influence the people in your business that approve these decisions is to make the benefits specific to your own company. Focus on how it solves specific challenges to your business today. And to do this, you should use data and metrics. Most likely you will need to be presenting a business case to senior people in your company who have the authority to approve or reject your proposal. Come prepared to those meetings with a strong case underpinned by data and key metrics. Consider that every different team across your company will also be asking for similar investment. So these people will want to have the information that allows them to make a more informed decision and understand more about the potential return on investment that this can bring. This is a method that I've used and it's proved very successful for me to go into these conversations using data that is clear and transparent. The approach I have used is to understand how much time different roles within our teams are spending doing work that would be reduced or removed with a more developed design system in place. I call these wasted days. 
In this example, those wasted days are based on the amount of time over a typical two week delivery sprint is being carried out by these three core roles, a designer, an engineer and a test engineer. But why are these wasted days? These activities still need to happen. Well, they are wasted days because it is time that could be better spent doing other activities that have more value to the company. Creating more time to focus on activities that have a direct impact on creating better experiences for customers, such as discovery research and ideation. To get this sort of data within your own company, you can do this easily by asking a subset of your teams to capture their tasks and activities over a set period to get really rich data or even just setting up interviews and speaking with these roles in your teams to get a general understanding and idea of the types, sorts of times it's taking them to carry out these activities. But the real value comes from them being able to take this data and turn it into a really compelling story. What this table is showing is the total accumulation of these wasted days and the monetary value to the company for these days. I'm going to take a bit of a pause and give you time to digest this information. I'd really like you to focus on the last two columns. Over the course of a year, there is around 110 wasted days happening within a typical product team consisting of these roles. That is a lot of time to be spending on activities that could be more automated. Taking that further, you can see the monetary value of these wasted days. Nearly £40,000 per team of cost is going towards these activities. Taking this data and mapping it to the overall size of your team, or the overall amount of design and engineering roles in your business, will show the overall monetary value of these wasted days. There are on average 110 days of wasted work carried out by designers and engineers over the course of a year within their product teams, which equates to a cost of £40,000 per team. Now, based on seven to 10 teams, this means there is two hundred and eighty pounds to £400,000 per year of wasted design and engineering work that would be reduced or removed if there was a more developed system in place. This becomes a really compelling way to put forward business cases and investment asks for dedicated people or teams to solve these internal challenges. This is the method that has enabled us to influence our business to invest in dedicated people to build, scale and govern our design system. And it's a method I've used in previous roles with success also. We have these four dedicated roles in our team. And when I put forward the business case, I got greedy and actually asked for six roles, but we negotiated, I lost, and we agreed that we first needed these four roles to show the value and impact of this team before looking to scale. I don't believe there's anything groundbreaking about this. I just believe designers or design leads that work in small businesses or small design teams can find ways to influence their companies by, do, by being proactive and learning new ways and skills to show value. The work this team are doing is enabling designers who are focused on our customer facing products to deliver better experiences today. But importantly, it is also setting our team and our company up for success for tomorrow. If the challenges I've spoken about in this talk have resonated with you, I'd really recommend going away today and starting to understand why your teams have less time focused on key activities such as research and discovery. And once you know what these things are, look to create environments to help to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. It's been really great to share my experiences and thoughts in these areas with you. I hope you found something in there that you can take away back into your own teams. And just finally for me, I hope you all have an amazing time at the rest of the conference. And I'm looking forward to watching the rest of it with you.
Thank you. Wow, I mean, how fantastic was that? Designers can and should spend more time on empathizing with real business results. I, I loved how Matt said that we need to shift our narrative from the technical side of design systems to the influence layer. Uh, also, his stat on average that there's 110 days of wasted work carried out by designers and engineers over the course of a year, that's a lot. Let's, uh, let's all work on decreasing that number post-config, yeah? Next up on how to discuss how they drive change with design systems and processes is Alicia from Zapier. Fun fact, she's a new mother with a three-month-old baby and has traveled to San Francisco with them. Uh, I also hear she did some prep calls with her baby in her lap, uh, some serious dedication going on. Uh, also, I found out that Alethea had her own custom font design for these slides. Uh, very impressive. I'm sure your future son is going to watch this presentation back and be really proud. Here to talk about her philosophy of Trojan mice instead of Trojan horse, and other ways to create impact within your design organizations, please welcome Alethea. Go get them, champ. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alethea, and uh, I currently lead um, design operations at Zapier. I just want to start off, uh, yes, shout out to the Zapier fam who came. <laughs> Um, I want to thank um, all the folks who made Config possible this year, both virtually and in person, um, and also to the team at Figma for finding it worthwhile to, to have this space for design ops um, this year. I also want to give a special shout out to Louis for his very sharp insi uh, insights on my content, and to Nick Hubley for uh, letting me share my love um, of handwritten fonts. Um, so he's turned my handwriting into a font, which you'll see throughout this talk, and also for inspiring and encouraging, encouraging me to use my illustrations, which you'll also see throughout this um, talk, and also for bringing to life some of my story through his animations. So years ago, before working in product design, I actually studied microorganisms in the soil. And it's interesting to realize that so many things happen because of soil. Flowers bloom, crops grow, water is purified, and even the climate is regulated, all because there's this hidden, complex ecosystem that's, that's hidden to the naked eye um, beneath the ground. So much of what we see in the natural world is actually upheld by these microscopic, invisible components that we usually don't pay much attention to simply because we don't see them. Well, the same applies to our design teams. So if we use Michael Polivka's analogy of design soil, behind the scenes, what design operations does is it lays the hidden foundation for designers to do their best work through things like crafting onboarding programs so that new designers feel like they belong on the team and they understand their jobs clearly, or taking care of licenses and renewals so that there's no service interruption for designers, or maybe it's establishing design rituals so that um, collaboration and joy can be baked into the work. These are just a few examples of the programs that make up the design soil of design ops work. Like soil, design ops creates the most optimal conditions for both the design and those who design to flourish. At Zapier, in our design ops playbook, we echo Alison Rand about ops bring, being the art of bringing together strategy and execution into harmony. What this looks like is figuring out at a high level what what the design team needs in order to move in the right direction for the business, and then being on the hook on the ground for implementing those solutions in a way that makes sense to designers. So this slide, it's not even a comprehensive summary of all the nuts and bolts um, of our ops work, but it does give a window into where and how um, we might get involved across the design org. So things like facilitating rituals, to measuring team health, to aligning design teams around process. 
Today, I want to share some examples of how design ops, as this invisible, often underestimated practice, creates the space to enable meaningful change in our growing design orgs. We'll talk about growth-oriented change, why partnerships are key to creating change, how systems and habits sustain that change, and what we can keep doing to learn from feedback over time. So you might have noticed that I love talking about change, um, and I hope you'll see by the end of this talk just how much agency you have at the interface of change leadership and your design org. So let's talk about why growing design orgs need change. But first, here's what I mean by growth in the context of design orgs. Today, I'm referring to growth much more qualitatively than just ARR, so annual recurring revenue or headcount. Designers and design orgs grow simply by having the desire to learn new things, to experiment with evolving their practice, and trying to do things differently, and hopefully better. After moving from Europe to North America, I've been lucky to work in design orgs of different sizes across public and private spaces with very different organizational contexts. Um, what these orgs all had in common, though, was the common desire to grow their design, their design practice. Um, whether that meant establishing a new design team or rebuilding their design system more accessibly or learning how to work with content designers. When Antoine Bedward first recruited me to join the, the Canadian Public Service, our mission was to establish a new design team, something that the department had never seen before. And so, of course, that meant hiring. Um, I'm curious to know if anyone here has actually tried applying for a government job before. Oh, a few, a few. <laughs> That's interesting. So, okay, so imagine being a design manager, trying to hire top tier talent for your new design team in government and being told that the hiring process actually looks something like this. Um, so there's a version of this image circulating somewhere on Reddit and uh, it basically shows the 75 steps of hiring in government. This is in Canada. Um, so it's a lot and the timeline from end to end, especially if you're new um, or recruiting, sorry, recruiting someone new to government um, can take you know, anywhere from six months, even up to a year. So let's simplify the process from the previous slide. Let's imagine that this orange square with the H uh, represents the moment a hiring manager starts the recruiting process. And this purple square with the C is when the candidate actually hears back. You can see that they're separated by these sort of dark circles, which represent all the administrative steps. So for example, figuring out what skill set is needed for the role. In government speak, we call that the statement of merit criteria, or um, more affectionately, the SOMCA. Um, and so as an ops person, I wondered, I started wondering, you know, what if we could make this process even just 1% less painful? And so I started to experiment with three things. The first was, what if we could front load some of these steps? In essence, we take care of them up front so that we can shorten that journey between hiring manager and candidate. So for example, let's be proactive about drafting that SOMCA and then getting it translated into our official languages, so French and English in Canada, well before we even reach out to any potential design candidate. The second experiment was, um, well, what if we could automate some of these steps? So we built an email sequence that would be sent to each candidate depending on um, which round they made it to. And it ended up saving me so much time that I ultimately got to spend more time giving more personalized feedback to those who made it further along the hiring process. Then my third thought was, Applying to government is so notorious for being a black box. What if we had better communication around all these major steps? So from our uh, first contact with any designer, we started to make it a point to disclose how much they'd make, how we'd evaluate them and when, and why this particular timeline. We also came up with a non-values doc that we communicated with candidates, which is essentially just an honest set of reasons why somebody wouldn't want to work um, on our design team in government. Ultimately, through trial and error of small-scale changes, we redesigned what design hiring could look like in government. Instead of taking six months to bring someone in the door, we narrowed it down to two months. 
And instead of looking only at internal, internal candidates, we were so much more intentional about seeking out and attracting talent who had rich, diverse skill, set, skill sets and experiences and bringing those folks in to help shape what design could look like in government. As we tried to grow our design organization, we realized we had to fundamentally change the way that we operate as early as recruitment. So design hiring is just one example of design ops touching the experience of the designer before they even touch the design of our product. If designers aren't supported through hiring and onboarding, aren't provided with the right tools, don't have clear processes or opportunities to grow and share their knowledge, then they can't do their best work. And ultimately, that debt always trickles down to the product and to our customers. We have to remember that the quality of our user experience is intricately tied to our designer's experience. So we've just talked about the importance of change in growing design orgs and how design ops facilitates that. But meaningful change takes a village. And so I want to talk about um, why the ops work just isn't possible without strong partnerships. At Ceridian, their fully remote and distributed design team grew from just a handful of designers to several dozen in less than a year. And in the process, our ops team was busy establishing and also revisiting important rituals like design critiques, also known as CRITs. CRITs are one of those feedback-focused rituals that, when done right, are meant to help us explore new angles and uh, avoid, avoid blind spots and create higher quality work. But as essential as CRITs feel to the design process, they're surprisingly difficult to get right in our uh, design orgs. So after rolling out our first version of CRITs with the growing team, we started noticing some hiccups. Um, so it was time, we realized, to critique our own design critique. But our ops team didn't work alone. Instead, we facilitated a meeting of the minds uh, with designers and researchers who themselves formed the design critique crew. And over a period of three months, collectively, ops, design, and research got in touch with designers to figure out what needed to change. A few of these improvements included better training around design crit etiquette or reshuffling folks in the pods to make sure that the work being shared was always relevant. Um, also, creating a new FigJam template that gave designers the flexibility to leave silent feedback on design work. As an ops person, I loved seeing designers take the reins on improving design crits and even having one of the researchers here um, rolling out and sharing these new changes with the rest of the design team. Design ops work is made so much more impactful when we enable designers and researchers to be active participants in creating the change they want to see on their teams. So this is the FigJam template, for example, that I was just referring to that was created for designers by designers um, at my previous role working at Ceridian. After revamping our crits, we saw attendance nearly double. Designers and researchers were so much more engaged across pods. And one designer said that they went from sort of dreading crits to treasuring the time and, uh, and the feedback so very much. While our design teams are busy designing, building, and testing components, design ops um, is there to help build the invisible components by partnering alongside them to drive change in our organizations. So sometimes we create the change, and other times change happens to us. But either way, how do you navigate change in your growing design work over time? Let's talk about systems and habits. So we're living in a time um, where many companies are realigning their business strategy, their product, and, and revisiting their org structures in order to remain relevant and competitive in today's economy. 
So at the start of this year, I um, may or may not have been part of a design org that looked like the one on the left, and then one month later, found myself uh, somewhere in the scheme on the right. So instead of every unit rolling up into A, we have design and research rolling up into B, brand studio reporting into C, and data now reports into D. So let's take a breath. The context is that at Zapier this past year, we added new faces to our design leadership team, and we've been building out our content design and design ops practices. And with a reorg to start off the new year, all those changes brought our leadership team together to ask ourselves, what is our vision for 2023 and beyond? How do we want to lead the design team? What are our priorities as a product design, content design, and design ops team this year? With design ops as facilitator, we tackled these questions through a series of workshops that turned vision into ideas and ideas into action. Design Ops was there to wrangle all the data from the workshops into themes and goals. So for example, theme number three was, how can we champion the impact of design across the business? And then um, we targeted the priority projects that would actually move the needle forward on those themes. And then we came up with a system to make that work visible, to track it, and to keep each other accountable. In a context with so much change and growth, we had a clear action plan for the way forward. By supporting design leaders and designers to set goals and break them down into systems and habits, design ops plays such an important role in operationalizing a vision of something into actual practice. And finally, how can we keep learning from change? So I've just shared uh, you know, a bunch of examples where we tried to navigate what meaningful change could look like in a design org, from streamlining design hiring and government to improving our design crits to making sense of a big reorg. And maybe you're thinking, um, I'll never get around to doing all that because I just don't have time. Or this will never happen in my org because we don't have a dedicated design ops um, on our team. It's like trying to win the war all at once with the Trojan horse. Complex, we're trying to change a massive thing in our orgs, can be complex, slow, and usually not very sustainable. So let me introduce you to the Trojan mice. Um, has anyone here heard of Trojan mice? Just curious. No? Oh, a couple of people, that's, that's good. Um, so yeah, so unlike a Trojan horse, Trojan mice are these little experiments that we can send off through the gates and learn from, regardless of what comes back. The point is to build a focused feedback loop where we run small tests and gather meaningful data to inform our future tactics. So maybe it's updating your designer onboarding program with more more relevant and better resources around accessibility. Maybe it's providing valuable feedback on a flexible design career ladder in your org. Or maybe it's creating opportunities to sync up and partner with your design system team. Sometimes the change will take, and other times you'll just learn from what didn't work. But Trojan Mice is all about starting small. Small-scale changes make a big difference collectively over time as long as we're intentional about gathering feedback and putting into action what we've learned. With Trojan Mice, we're actually helping our design orgs iterate. So I know we talk about, oftentimes we talk about the files iterating. So our Figma files, this prototype, this mock-up, um, those are the works in progress. But Actually, the real work in progress is not just the file, it's us, it's our teams. Our design teams are the real work in progress. Um, and so now it's your turn. I'd like to ask you a series of questions based on this talk that'll hopefully get you thinking about how to tackle your organization's design operations, whether you have a formal design ops title or not. Is your design soil healthy? So are there gaps in your workplace that could help designers and design flourish more? What kind of design org do you want to be a part of? Think about the values that are meaningful to you. Is this reflected in your work? 
Is this expressed in the way your organization works? Who are your allies for change? Who can you partner up with on an initiative that will bring about meaningful change in how and where you work? How will you keep yourself accountable to your goals? What kinds of systems and habits can you set up to keep you on track towards your goals? What kinds of Trojan mice can you set up? Are there small experiments that you can launch today, tomorrow, next quarter, to try to improve something in your org? And finally, what will you do with that feedback? I'd like to end by saying that change can be a beautiful thing. It's the DNA of design ops, and it's what's at the very heart of our growing design teams. Instead of thinking of change as a necessary evil or some kind of impossible feat, um, as designers, let's design the spaces we want to work in. One small scale change, one Trojan mice, one invisible component at a time. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> I'm really grateful. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to wish you a wonderful day and hopefully I'll catch you, um, some of you around at, at Config.